it's really a great pleasure for me to be here. I probably haven't given a talk to such a big audience before. It's really overwhelming to see uh, so many people have turned up. And I felt so sorry that uh, it's just a matter of three days. I couldn't make it just three days ago, but I could make it today. But still, um, all of you could arrange this talk for me. Um, so what I've decided to do today is talk about something that has come for many years of work uh, in the area of optimization, but mostly solving practical problems. Okay. Oftentimes in, in, a, in a university setup, we try to publish and we do academic work and then wait and see if they have any practical relevance at some point. But fortunately, while I was in Kanpur, uh, GM, for example, the, the India Science Lab, and many other uh, Indian in industries was you know, funding my work. And that was a great way to get to know what I'm doing at the university, whether that has any practical relevance. So right from the beginning, my work took a practical aspect. And that's probably the reason why my work gets cited a bit, because people can see that these are not just for the sake of an algorithm that we publish, but this has applications. And a lot of them has been applied to various fields, and fortunately, people have followed. So uh, citation is a, is a big thing, and in and, 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 and academic environments, we always aspire to get as much citations as we want. Because all across the world these days, um, promotions and uh, awards and everything are, are based on citation is one such metric. But I would like to point out, it's not the only thing. Uh, and there are many other ways you can also have your work known and get it valued that, that, that what you have contributed. But one thing about citation is that you cannot control it, right? You, you work on it, you have a paper published, and then it depends on others, whether they get benefited with your work or not, and then they cite or not. So you don't have a direct control. So that's why I think many places they try to look at that. So it's a good feeling that uh, when you do something and people are following it and, and then utilizing it not only in academics but in, uh, in industries as well. So uh, as Professor has mentioned that I am a Koenig Endowed Chair Professor at Electrical and Computer Engineering. So here is my email address. Um, you can write to me in case you find something interesting and want to know a bit more. My personal website is here. And my laboratory is called COIN, Computational Optimization and Innovation Laboratory. That's the symbol we came up with. It has a DNA kind of structure and the COIN kind of coming out from it. Uh, I'm also part of this Beacon Center, which is a National Science Foundation Center for Study of Evolution in Action. So it's the 10th year running now. Uh, so it's about $5 million funding for every year. Uh, so we enjoyed for the last 10 years with all the work that we are doing related to any kinds of evolution. So obviously, here uh, we, were, we are utilizing it for evolutionary optimization. And this is the Spartan logo of Michigan State uh, University, where I'm a part. All right, so um, what I would like to do is very simply going to talk to you about, so it'll be a talk on optimization, okay? because this is what I spend all my life on. So I'm going to share some of it with you, but uh, with a specific purpose. So first of all, I'd like to show you what is the scope of optimization is practice? Because sometimes we just know that optimization is only for design, or maybe sometimes in manufacturing. I'm going to run down with a number of different examples where these methods are used. Uh, there are a lot of myths and challenges. When I go to industry, talk to them, uh, there are certain issues that I have to overcome first. So I'd like to share that with you. Those of you who are interested in working with industries and practice, you will also probably face the same kind of issues. So I'd like to warn you a little bit of what is that you're going to expect. Um, but I'm going to focus on this word, customization, because that's really the way, I think, to go in optimization. So I'm going to lay out why you need to have a customized optimization. And I'm going to use few case studies that I've done with industries, very few of them, because of time. One of them will include a very large scale problem. Uh, I'm going to keep it a suspense of how large is the problem that I've solved, but just to tell you that nobody has solved yet such a big problem. Okay? Uh, and then there is some um, outcome that coming out from optimization in terms of knowledge discovery. So this way, we are bringing in the computer science, AI, and machine learning communities focusing on 
optimization. So I'm going to make that connection over here. Again, show you some examples of uh, what I mean and how you can get knowledge. All right, so this is a busy slide. Here we've got few of the practicalities where optimization can be routinely used. First and foremost, of course, design and manufacturing. It doesn't matter which field you are in, um, as long as there are certain parameters, like you see some angles, uh, some materials, some dimensions. Uh, before you design, you need, to f you need to come up with the right number for each of them so that you have an optimal design. When I talk about optimal, you can have one criteria, you can have multiple criteria. Uh, most cases, if you have one criteria, it is a lightweight design. So that's a very common word in auto industries, for example. So that means you're interested in minimizing the weight of the whole car, cab, body, and it has to satisfy certain constraints, like when you have a crash, a uh, frontal crash, for example, uh, the, the def deflections that are coming to the, the dummy uh, should be minimum. So there should be minimum or within, with, within certain constraints. Uh, there could be some other uh, constraints that you, will, that you can put over there. So usually an optimization comes like that. You have a criteria, at least one criteria, and there will be a number of constraints that you have to satisfy. And you have a number of parameters that you can change. We call them as variables. Okay? So then there are other problems like, let me take this modeling. So there are, this is a blast furnace model that I'm showing, and it can happen in other areas as well. That you have a system which you don't completely understand. We are producing steel for more than 100 years now. Okay? But still, everything inside, what goes on in a blast furnace is not known not known to metallurgists. They know quite a bit, but not exactly what goes on. And many of the things here cannot be controlled completely, like all the uncertainties that come with the inputs. You want them to be with certain dimensions, but you cannot exactly ensure that every time you are putting all these coke centers and pellets, they satisfy those dimensions. So you, you expect uncertainties. And then there is a thing here that the, uh, the operator has to control, how much hot air he has to put in. It really entirely depends on his mood, okay? So if he had a fight with his wife in the morning, you'll get slightly different still over here. So now how do you model such a thing, okay? When things depends on which is not in your control and you cannot put a crisp number to all of them. So the first task in such cases is, can I model the quality of the steel, let's say the strength of the steel that comes out of it as a function of all these inputs? Obviously, if you try to write a mathematical function, it's not going to be accurate you got to have uh, some other way of representing it. Maybe a neural net, maybe a deep neural network, maybe a, some other kind of formalism that you have here, which can provide you some kind of a regression of the output versus a number of inputs, and it has to be a stochastic one, right? So optimization can be a vehicle to get that. Scientific experiments, oftentimes we do either in computer or in, uh, in, a, in a laboratory, the experiments can be very expensive. And you've already done, let's say, 20 different experiments, and you spend already a lot of money, and now you want to do five more. You don't want to randomly put those five. You have to, you have to use an optimization to figure out where you should put your experiments, the next five ones, so that you get maximum signal out of it. Okay, so you need an optimization to tell you that. Of course, supply chain has become a big issue in, in many of the uh, product industries these days, placement. Uh, then control, optimal control for any kind of power systems, uh, uh, you know, automobile and all that. Prediction, uh, you know the market in the past few months, few weeks, and then can you model that well so that you can predict? And a lot of companies are making money if you can make a good prediction of how the market has been behaving. And then with the, with the age of data, there's a lot of data mining task requires optimization for classification, clustering, prediction, and all that stuff. And I think anything that you have to do with uh, intelligence, you have to come up with an intelligent system, intelligent component, any kind of system that has its own brain and can do something not like a hard code program will tell it to do, but it has to do on its own, optimization has to come in because optimal solutions are special solutions in the whole search space, right? They optimize certain criteria. All you have to do is choose a proper criteria and if you can come up with solutions, you can expect them to show uh, some kind of intelligence, okay? So these are some few snapshots as you see and each of you sitting here probably 
I touched upon a few things that goes very close to your work or your interest. So if optimization is so important, a big question to ask here is why not? We have such optimization as a compulsory course in, an, in our engineering or university curriculum. It's a good question to ponder. And, and, and I strongly believe students coming up with a formal course in some methods of optimization, what this can do, will have a much better market value eventually. There's another one I wanted to put it uh, as a separate slide because this is becoming a new trend in the area of optimization. It's called hierarchical optimization. These are known in many different ways, multi-level, bi-level, tri-level. Uh, but, but why is it important? Because well, our system works in a hierarchical manner. You look at the university setup, you look, up, look at the society, the government, and then uh, the, the people under the government, right? We do that because the administration becomes easier. So there are two kinds of, at least in this scenario, we call it a bi-level optimization, where there is a government that's at the higher level. They have their own optimization problem to solve. Okay? For example, they, they care about environment, they care about the revenue they're making. From what? From taxes that probably farmers pay. So if the farmer are mainly interested in, for example, the profit that they get out of uh, their field and how much they are producing and all that, they may not care much about the environment. Government sees that, that they are using uh, you know, fertilizers that are having a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and going to the lakes and polluting them. Now government cannot come and say, hey, you cannot do that. All they could do is they could put high taxes on some fertilizers that they think are, are more dangerous than the others. And once they fix that, the farmers then look at and see if they buy this particular fertilizer, how much tax they have to pay. If they buy the other one, how much they have to pay. So they solve their own problem. So you, but you can see the interlink here, right? Anything the change here changes the outcome of the government. So, go, so sorry, the farmer. So farmer is at the lower level, the government is at the upper level, and they are linked. So if you think of all these um, uh, supply chain problems we talked about, we did some projects with uh, Dow Chemical Industries uh, back in Michigan, where they have this issue of distribution centers all over North America, and then they have their productions, and they have very high level decisions which they make every two, three years once. And then there are, uh, every six monthly, they have to decide on which truck companies they should tie up with for taking their goods from their warehouses to the zip codes. Okay? And then daily they have to make decisions. Daily, which truck will take what product to which place. So if you look at these three levels, they're all different. They're at a different scale, but they all have to be integrated. If you don't integrate, then uh, you are not getting the, the final practical solutions. So we, we have shown them that they can have uh, increasing amount of reduction in the transportation cost if they consider from single level to bi level to tri level. So these are getting to be into the mainstream of research, but computationally they're very, very expensive. So we are working on figuring out how to do the lower level in a quick way because you call them so often. So now with this idea of what are different problems and uh, where optimization can be used, uh, what kind of algorithms do we have? What kind of methods do we have? So there are basically two types. One is this point-based methods, which are usually, there's not much heuristics. You actually use a lot of theory and, and um, ideas of optimization. I mean, you all studied uh, in your high schools finding the minima of a function fx, right? You, you make a derivative, put it equal to zero, then look at the second derivative. Some of these methods are little advanced versions of those. Uh, they work very well if you have derivatives and if the functions, functions are not that complex and there are not much compli complications that are happening. But they're usually local. You start from one point, you can get, get to a local optima. Then there is other kinds of algorithms which are more um, population-based. So there is not one point going to another point going to another point, but a number of points moving to another set of points and so on and so forth. So they, are, they have a more, more global perspective because of this number of points that you see around. And many of these algorithms are motivated by some natural principles. So what we talk about next on evolutionary optimization is, is based on this population-based approach. So here is a sketch of a point-based algorithm. You start with a guess point x. And then there is a transition rule that the algorithm will have. So if you are developing one, you need to come up with what kind of transition rule. That means given x, 
What would be my new point? What would be my new solution? Y. Okay? And then once you create Y, you compare that with X. And if Y is better, accept it. And then change the Y with the transition rule in the next iteration. If Y is not as good as X, then ignore it. Okay? So that's how you go. Keep doing this till a termination criteria is met. And all these things I'm talking about are important. What termination criteria, how you do the transition rule, the comparison, would it be always deterministic like this, that if y is better than x, then only you accept it? Or sometimes if y is worse than x, you're still willing to accept it. So there are simulated annealing which actually does that. With the probability, it accepts y, even though it's worse than x. So uh, there are many methods that use this. They're very simple, as you see. They don't require much memory. Because all you have to do is store two vectors, x and y, right? Um, but they have this local perspective. Because if you start from here, comparing this is your x, that's your y. If y is better, you stay there. If you had created y here, you will not accept it because it's, it's worse when you're maximizing. So you have this tendency to get stuck to a local solution. There's not much parallel processing you could do. Although you may have lots of parallel GPUs or parallel processors uh, at your disposal, but you will not be able to use it because there's only two solutions you have. So you can't use a, a, a good set of parallel processors that you may have. They're easier to do theory because you're just dealing with two points. Okay? And oftentimes, as I said, the transition rules comes with the derivative concept, so you can, you can do that. But one thing I want to highlight here is that they're not very easy to be modified. So, if you look at textbooks on optimization, there are many algorithms like that. They will come with the transition rule by the name of the person who developed it. Cauchy's method, Newton's method, Marquardt's method. These are some people early on, they came up with a good transition rule. And it's their method. If you want to change it, it'll be your method. But it's very difficult to change and, and figure out and get it accepted to, to, be, to be used by everybody. Uh, so they're not very flexible to be changed. All you could do is run that method and see where it's going, whether it's useful or not. On the other hand, the population-based methods, you start with a set of points. A population is what I call. Um, and then there's a transition rule that takes a population and changes to an, another population, Q. There can be overlaps between P and Q. Some, there could be some common members of Q and P. And then you compare Q with P. So now you're doing uh, you know, a, multi, a kind of set comparison, not just one point with the other. So all kinds of advanced principles now are needed here. So the usually what we do to compare is we put them together as a big set, as a bigger set, and then we use some performance criteria to choose the top half of those. Because if this is of size n, this is of size n, we have a 2n set, and then we take the top, the better half of it, and call this the new population, and that goes into this and into the loop, so until a termination criteria is met. Again, the ideas are simple. You need to come up with what kind of transition rule, and what kind of termination criteria, and how you're going to do these steps. So there are these three things that you have to do. OK, now this requires a lot of memory, because now you have to store the whole population P and whole population Q. But these days, memories are not that expensive. They're affordable. You could do that. Uh, but they have a global perspective. Because there is a set of points, so it's very unlikely that they'll get stuck. Um, they are, they're great for parallel processing, because now, if you have multiple processors, so imagine here, so you created a set of point Q, before you evaluate and compare with P, you need to actually evaluate each one of the members of Q. So if Q has, let's say, 50 points in it, there are 50 points here, if you have 50 processor, so each of these you can do um, you know, separately and with one processor. So by the time one is evaluated, all 50 has been evaluated. So if you have more and more processors, you can actually have more and more size of Q, and it gets much better and better. So you can directly take advantage of that. But the flip side is not easy to do theory, because there are 50 of them to track. Okay? You want to track really the best of the 50, but uh, those of you who know this, the best is a non-differentiable quantity. So it's very difficult to do theory. With a, with a population of points moving around. So we do some kind of average analysis to that, but average may still haven't re uh, reached near the optima, but could be one of them has reached the optima. So sometimes we do average and standard deviation to figure out where we are. Okay? But the great thing about these methods are they are very easy to be changed, because all these transition rules, uh, you can change it very easily. 
and I will show you what I mean by that. So these are the two types of methods that are out there. And sometimes we use both. We start with one and move to the other. But in general, people just follow one because either they like theory or they don't like theory. They want to take control of the whole algorithm, so they go in for the population-based approach. But what is the status of optimization in industry? Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, many people in industry think optimization produces a brittle solution. By that they mean is uh, it's a theoretical solution. You did all that, applied the algorithm, came up with a solution, but when I try to implement it, it's not going to work because there are a lot of uncertainties when I try to implement a solution. You ask me that this dimension should be 50 mm, and I used a manufacturing process to get 50 mm, but we know that every manufacturing process has a tolerance, right? So what if we get 50.5? And if your solution is not so good now, if it goes from 50 to 50.5, what you have end up with a brittle solution. So it's not, not implementable. But other thing they mean by brittle is that most of the time in optimization, what people know in the industry is a single objective optimization. You have used the lightweight design, for example. So your algorithm has come up with a solution that is excellent for weight. It's, it's probably the least weight, but it's no good for any other reason. It's probably not a very high quality solutions. And you don't want that in an industry. You also want not one thing, but a number of things simultaneously. So they know that you are not doing, you are not considering other criteria, and you are giving me a solution that's good for one criteria. Uh, so that's some of the reasons they don't like. Other things I've seen people saying is, oh, your algorithm is not, doesn't have a proof. So if I use a different initial solution like the PX I told you or the X to start with, I will end up in a different solution, okay? Sometimes it happens. But if an algorithm, if that happens, it's not a very good algorithm. We don't want that to happen. But that's the experience of some of the industrial people that that's, that's what they have to do. So that means they have to run many times and they don't have time for that. Uh, they also think, many of them, in that optimization means linear programming, operations research, quadrating programming at most. Uh, there are nonlinear programming methods, but they think that those do not have proofs. So um, we, were, we can only do optimization if the objective functions constraints are all linear. Um, the optimization is too idealistic, as I said already, that they're more academic. They don't have a place in, in industry. So what I often hear here from practitioners is when I introduce with them that I work in optimization, they said, oh, we've tried optimization. It didn't work for us. OK, so your first, your second, first you say, hello, how are you? And I work in optimization. And they tell you this. Um, you have to restart the whole discussion. You need at least 10 minutes after that. And oftentimes, they don't have that. So many times, I'm just thrown out of the company and then try again in some other way. Uh, this is a hard work. But then the reason for that is optimization is a baggage that comes. It's not a new thing. People know about it. And people, the, the, unfortunately, the view people have who has not really delved into optimization that much. They have a very older view of some of these that I mentioned here. That's changing. And there are a lot of people are in that process in changing them, including some software companies. But this is the real existence. One other thing I'm going to talk to you about, and that's true, it has been proven, is this what is known as no free lunch theorem. Uh, it's this theorem actually, it, it says what it says here is that uh, you cannot have one algorithm good for everything. So that's, that's the real bottom line of this. But these two gentlemen in 1997 came up with a proof that says, let's say if you have two algorithms, A1 and A2. A1 can be a very simple one of the hill climbing methods that you can borrow from somewhere. A2 could be something you developed in your PhD thesis, spending two, three years, and you're very proud of it. Uh, now you say you are comparing these two. They say, if you're interested in solving all possible problems that can come to you, what you do is you apply algorithm A1 to each member of F with certain time. So let's say F, the F1, the first problem, I'm going to use 1,000 evaluations maximum. Second problem, I can use 10,000 evaluations. So you specify whatever. For that fixed resource, for each of them, you already do, you have a performance measure. Take an average performance measure. Let's say call that P1. So basically saying, A1 applied to all of these problems with certain 
fixed resources, gives you a performance metric, an average performance metric of P1. You do the same thing for A2 with the same amount of resource on the same computer, you get P2, and they proved P1 is equal to P2. It doesn't matter what A1 and what A2 you have. So what does it tell us? It tells us your algorithm that you've come, if they're shown to be very good in certain problems, you just haven't yet tried some other problems where your algorithm is not going to work as well. Okay? So this actually allows us not to make big claims that here is an algorithm that can solve all your problems. If anybody makes such a claim in the context of optimization, you can point them to this theory says you are violating NFL. Okay? So, but that means that if we specify a problem class, here it says all problems. So if we specify, let's say, a particular wing design of, a, of an aircraft, okay, or a gearbox, or a control system problem, when we specify a class, then there can be a good, the best algorithm for that class. So what this reminds us is before we make big claims, we have to first specify what kind of class of problems we are interested in, and then we can find the best algorithm. That's where the idea of customization comes in. So once you specify the problem, if a company wants to do routinely, let's say, gearbox design, but uh, someday there could be a small gearbox, and other day there could be lots of speeds are needed, so you have lots of gear, but that's the same class of problem. Okay? They will probably have very similar objective function and constraints and requirements and variables. So you can come up with the best algorithm, but then that will only come if you understand what it takes to have a good algorithm there and customize an algorithm for that. Then, and you develop that for the company and they can use it every day or, or, or routinely. So that's the path I have taken for many years now, is the customization for complex problem solving. I probably said all this here, so let me just skip this slide and get to what I, little bit more about how to do the customization. So these parts I've also mentioned, so let me go to, I don't think I need to tell you a, a sketch of an evolutionary algorithm. It's a population-based method. It's a very simple strategy. You start with a set of points, uh, evaluate these points, and then while not terminate, you choose good solutions out of it. Let's say these are some good solutions of that. Use them in the selection process. So the selection process chooses these good points. And then you apply a set of variation operators to create new solutions. And there could be recombination or mutation kind operators which exchanges information between two or more solutions. And then you create an offspring population. I'm showing you in sketch here with these open circles. So these are parents and these open circles are offspring. You combine them together and keep the better half. So for example, these two from parents and this five from the offspring can come and stay as a new population. Now this population now becomes come up over here in the do loop and you keep doing this process. If you're doing it right, you'll see two, two, things, you'll see two things happening. One is some kind of a representative point of this population will approach the optima and the variance of this population will reduce as you go. So it's a cloud that's moving towards the optima getting more and more dense. So that's how you'll see a simulation happening if you're able to show the simulation. So that's, that's an evolutionary method. There are 100 plus different evolutionary approaches or meta heuristics are available. Okay, there are certain niches that this method has. They have a lot of flexibility. All these places I said, recombination, mutation, uh, termination conditions, initialization, you could actually use problem information. And I'm going to show you how we do these things in certain problems. It's a population approach, so you, as I said, you have a much more global perspective. The other thing is, if you want to get multiple solutions, like in a multi-objective or multi-modal scenario, you can actually find number of solutions in one run. There are direct approaches, we don't use gradients, but, but if gradients are available, we also use them. And the parallel implementation is, is really easy. So let me show you a couple of customization, just as an idea of what you could do. Let's say I've got a problem where there are n variables, but I have a relationship. I know that in my problem, x1 will be always bigger than or equal to x2. x2 will always be bigger than or equal to x3. What is such a problem? If you think of um, a building design, a high-raise building design, all the dimensions on the ground floor is going to be bigger than or equal to the one in the first floor, then bigger than or equal to the second floor, and so on and so forth, because the weight is kind of getting added up as you go down, right? So every civil engineering 
student or, or structural engineers will tell you that this is what you're going to expect. You don't expect your ground floor to have small thickness, all the beams, and, and the fifth floor has the maximum dimension. You'll never see that, right? So if we know that as an engineering intuition for a problem, how can we enforce that? That every solution I create in my optimization process will make sure that this is satisfied, okay? So what you could do is you say, okay, instead of using x1 to xn, you say I'm going to use x1 to pn, where x1 is the same as x1, is the dimensions of the ground floor. p2 is not x2, but p2 is equal to x2 divided by x1. And I'm making sure p2 has a bound from 0 to 1. Because it's a fraction, maximum it can be 1, x2 will be always less than x1. You see, now you can use any number over here between 0 and 1, and any number here, you will have a reduction in the dimensions. So this is one trick that you can use. This is a customization. But now you're making sure this is always satisfied. If this is a wrong assumption, then of course your solution will always be wrong. But you've got to be absolutely sure this is what you want to do. One other problem is this cantilever beam often we do, where there is a load at the end. You expect the dimensions here at the root are going to be much higher as then you go down. So there are many problems uh, in practice in engineering we see with some order like that. And then you can think of a new way of representing your variables, and you will see your algorithms are doing very well. We are talking about finance, and there are many problems in finance where we deal with proportions. So if you have some amount of money to invest, and let's say there are 20 different companies you want to invest, okay? So you want to basically figure out how much of my money, what proportion of my money I want to put on stock one, how much to stock two, how much to stock three. So if these are proportions, when you add them up, it should be one, right? Because you want to spend all your money. So that's a natural constraint that comes in. If you keep x1, x2, xn between 0 and 1 and, and create some random numbers for these, when, do, when you add them, it's not going to be 1, right? Very, with a very small probability, it will be 1. But what you could do is you create them randomly like that, but do this operation. Divide every one of them by the sum. And now you have a new variable. When you sum all of them, they're always going to be 1. So it's a very simple trick but you're utilizing this constraint information to change your variable, but you can see how good, how efficient your algorithm becomes because you're satisfying a constraints already. So there are many other things we have developed over the years, simple tricks to use problem information back to optimization. There are many more in case of um, a scheduling problem where it's a VLSI placement on a board. Uh, you could actually, you're actually coming up with the edge or, or more of a path or, or a combinatorial problem. Uh, there are nice ways you could do it because of time. I don't want to get into this, but we do this for many different problems. This is a transit network problem where the buses are arriving on a particular route and then people are transferring from one route to the other route, go to another place. Now, obviously, one, one kind of constraint that comes in is a person arriving at this time cannot transfer to a bus that has already left, right? But this is easy for me to say. But if you want to make a LP or QP or a, or a traditional formulation, just to make sure that this is not happening, that you are transferring here to there, you need to have lots of Boolean variable. Or those are artificial. You have to put it in your formulation. Formulation gets ugly with lots of lots of these Boolean variable to handle. And then you look for a mixed integer programming. These variables are not there in your problem, but you have to use them so that you can use a standard algorithm. And oftentimes blowing up the problem size. But if you have a very flexible algorithm like evolutionary methods, as I said, you don't need these things. Okay? You can have a procedure-based things. In many cases in industry, I found that they already have some solutions, but they are not happy with it, or they want to compete with others, or they want to do it in a more stable manner. But they say, I've got a couple of solutions. Would you like to use them? in your optimization, and I always say, please, give me, because that's always helpful. I'm using, the, I'm using those to get my initial population made. So what I do is I mutate these solutions around them. Sometimes I cross over them, I recombine them to create my initial population, so that there are more solutions like them I have created in my initial population. So I'm not starting with a random by, here there is no point, so maybe these points are bad. So the fact that these two are given, they are already being utilized, they must be good. So I'm using them, 
But not only those, I'm creating some new solutions having their properties. And let, then let the algorithm decide which is good or which is bad. And that makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, you could do many other things. You may have the entire space to put your points uniformly like this. Or sometimes the designer come and say, I don't want you to bias you. Uh, I don't want you to reduce from 0 to 10 that we are using here. But I know that the good solutions are around 6, are in the middle of that region. So then we create a population that has normally distributed around what they're saying. Very few points away from where they want. So this kind of information, when you ask from the designers, they also feel that they played a role in getting the solutions. It's not a complete black box that we have done coming from there. So they feel the ownership, that they, have, they own something, and they have this acceptability thing with that. There are many other ways we can change our operators. Again, let me not get into these, but these are routine things we do when you're solving with engineering problems. Some people in academics think we are diluting because we are utilizing problem information. It's not a pure research. Don't listen to that, those things. As long as your research is useful to somebody, it is meaningful. Okay? And it's nothing impure about all these things. You're actually utilizing problem information. What you're trying to show is how do I utilize the information? Okay? It's not cheating at all. It's, it's what the company needs. It's what uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing that has been developed over the years, we are trying to utilize those information. The key thing is how do you utilize it? So let me go into one example uh, that kind of will clarify much of the things that I'm talking about here. So this came from, came from this industry called PTC. They are in the foundry business, okay? So they melt some amount of metal. And they have a vessel of size, two different sizes, but let me just talk with one, 650 kilo. It's a big vessel, 650 kilo of metal you're melting. You have lots of options to pour them into make small, small castings, okay? So let's say you have done a few of them, and you have utilized 630 kilos. 20 kilos are still left in your vessel. If none of your casting is less than 20 kilos, that becomes a waste, right? Uh, because now you cannot utilize. In casting, you cannot do half done a casting and come back three hours later and pour the rest. Right? Either you do completely or not. So then you think, ah, if I have done some other combination, maybe I would have utilized 640 kilos. So I would have had a better metal utilization. And this fellow was struggling when he came to me. And then he said he runs an Excel code on his laptop for the whole night. And in the morning, he sees the solution. And he thinks that some of the things he can even change it on his own manually, because the algorithm he used is not able to do a very good job. And he's getting about 70 to 75% metal utilization. And he thinks more than 90% is achievable. So he said, can you do something? So I look at the problem and I formulate it. Uh, there is one objective function to maximize the metal utilization. Xij is my variable. I'll show you the variable matrix here. So here, these are the number of cast, the castings numbers. So maybe casting number one, two, three. Casting number one, you have to make seven copies. You have to deliver to the company seven copies of that. Two, seven copies, three, six copies. So these are the demands, okay? This is a schedule. From the heat one of 650 kilo, our algorithm says, make one copy of the second casting, one copy of the third casting, two of the seven, and one of the eight casting, and you'll be utilizing 623 kilos out of 650 kilos. So your utilization is 95.85%. Second heat, you're 94.62, and then you take an average over all the heats to produce these demand. You get, and take an average, you get 95.05. That's your objective function. You want to maximize. That's what I have written here. You see that it's linear in terms of xij. Xij doesn't have a square or any, any weird thing, right? It's a linear. What are the constraints? One set of constraints come from here. This one times the weight of 2. This one times the weight of 3. This one times the weight of 7. And this one times the weight of 8. Should be 623. And that should be less than or equal to 650. Because you can't utilize more than 650 kilos. You only melt at 650 kilos at any point. But the algorithm doesn't know it. You have to say it with this constraint. And what is this set of constraints? Column wise. When you sum all of them up from various hits, it should be exactly 7. Because you have to deliver 7. You don't want to make one less or one more. You want to make exactly those. So there are some equality constraints, which are all linear in x. Some inequality constraints, which are linear in x. One objective function which is linear in x. So what's the problem? 
Everything is linear. We know linear programming can solve millions of variables with that. And in this particular company case, we are interested in solving about 50,000 variables. So it should be a piece of cake, but the only problem is this statement here. Xij is what? Xij are these numbers. These cannot be non-integer, because if you say it's 1.5, that means you're saying make one copy of this completely, of third one, and then 0.5 copies of the next. You can't do that. You have to do either 1, 2, or 0, or, or any other integer, right? That makes all the difference in optimization, OK? The fact that they have to be discrete now, there is the, the only way to solve this is this known as branch and bound method. How it works? You assume here in your root node, the first optimization, everything is non-integer. Everything is real. So you solve the linear programming. You get a solution. This is for a two-variable two problem. And you get non-integer values, which are not allowed. Then you pick one at random. Let's say I picked x1 here. Uh, the floor of 4.56 is 4, and the seal of 4.56 is 5. So you construct now two different problems with one constraint added. So the same problem, this one has one constraint added. Solve again LP. You get, now based on the solution here, you will move further or fathom it, as they call it. There are three rules for fathoming. So what happens is if you have a large number of variables, you have large tree. The tree really grows. And after a certain point, it doesn't work. So it gets exponentially uh, expensive to solve it. So there are very nice softwares like IBM Simplex, GLPK, all these are available. I'll show you with a simple example. First, I took a very small size problem, which according to my calculation should require 310 variables. Remember, we have to solve 50,000 for the company. It's a very small size problem. I took, let's consider only Simplex because this is the industry standard software. Well, 310, it can solve in 0 0.05 second, piece of cake. You see 99.256% accuracy. This is actually the optimum. We go to 1,000 variables, 0.13 seconds, with 99.462%. It's also the optimum, because in this problem, we can figure out if it's an optimum or not. Then we move to 2,000. It cannot solve it. So I have some more things here. For that 2,000 variable run, the blue line here shows how many nodes it has opened in the branch and bound. I showed you six or seven there, right? After 30 seconds, this is 1800 seconds, 30 minutes, sorry. After 30 minutes of run, this blue here shows about 36, 37 million. So 37 million of those nodes that are opened after 30 minutes of the run, it's pretty fast. So many branches it has to make, right? Of them, the red line here shows how many are still left to be fathomed. Unless you fathom every one of them, you don't have a solution. And that number is almost 35,000. So 35,000 nodes are still to be fathomed. So I thought maybe another 10 minutes. So we keep on running it. We ran it actually 15 hours. Still did not convert. So it's still growing, all these. So it's a problem where when you go to 1,000, when you go half the size, it's able to solve in less than a minute, right? But then when you go to 2,000, something happens in between. And that's called the curse of dimensionality. In these kinds of problems which are not well thought of, you, you hit that curse of dimensionality. Right? So I could not have given a simplex solution to the company because they're interested in 50,000. So we came up with our own method. But what is our method? It's a population-based method. We need to create a good initial population. We need to pick two or three at a time and create good solutions by a recombination mutation concept. So we are taking the idea from there. Here is a simple idea which we used. So let's say this is a very small parent that I've taken and another parent. So these are existing solutions. Way I create the offspring is this. I take the first heat, compare with the first heat of the second parent. So how do I compare? This one says you utilize 343 kilos of metal. This one says I've utilized 625 kilos. So which is better? Remember, I have 650 kilo vessel. So this one has utilized it better. So I take a copy of that and put it here in my child. I'm creating the child now in that process, row by row. Then I look at the second one. It is asking me that it has to utilize 808 kilo. I've not melted that. That's why it's red. It's not a feasible solution. Let's see the second one. It's also not feasible, more than 650. But if I give you both the feasible, can you tell me which one is slightly better? 667, because it's closer to 650. So I take that and put it here. Go to the third one. This is 629. 
This is 606. This is definitely better. So I take that one and put it here. Like that, I keep forming because I could do partial evaluation and figure out in the whole solution here, how good is this part? How good is that part compared to the similar ones in the second parent? I could do this with multi-parent. I can take another parent and compare three of them simultaneously. OK, so we could do that as well. So this is a pure recombination idea. You are taking good things from two good parents, putting them into one child. No other algorithm, optimization algorithm, can do that. So that's the power of these population-based methods. In that process of creating the offspring, I've screwed up a few things. For example, here, um, these were all satisfied before the demand. But now that I've taken some from first parent, some from second, they are not matching anymore. It's a game now I play. I call this mutation one where I adjust this number. So what I do, I have, to be make, I have to make two here. So what I have to do now, I have to put this one somewhere here. I have to move this one of these ones somewhere there. And there is an algorithm I have. And that algorithm is very, it's taking not much evaluation, but it's guaranteed to satisfy all the constants. I guarantee that. Okay? And then I fix it, you see. I fix this here. So I call this a repair operator. So I did something with the recombination. It's not satisfying some of my constraints. I try to repair it. And then the other mutation operator, I have to repair this part. Can I fix this, that make it 650 or less? In some cases, we are able to do this, but in not all cases. And I don't spend a whole lot of time here trying to fix the solutions, because we have to leave something to the algorithm also to fix it. So this is also not very expensive. So I have these two mutation operator that works on the recombination and then create, try to create a better solution. So going back to those. Uh, examples that I showed you, 2,000 variable, simplex could not solve. We now solve it in 0.19 seconds, okay? and with the very high accuracy. But this is only 2,000 variable, right? Now from now on, everything I'm going to show you is on 1 million version. So company doesn't need it. So 1 million version of the problem. We are doing all these parametric studies. One thing that we do when we give to a software to a company is this population size sensitivity. So when you go from very small size to large size, you see that the algorithm gets better and better up to certain population size. Okay? After that, it doesn't matter what you use. But the number of evaluations goes up. So you want to be in a place where you have the smallest number of evaluation. With this kind of study, we told them, use 40 to 60 as the population size. So 40 to 60 to start with, yes. Uh, that's because when you have us just when it's working, it takes lots of iterations because the sample size that you have is only here, I think, 28 or something. So with 28 to get the optimum or close to what we desire, it takes lots of iterations. So every iteration, you're spending 28 new evaluation, but the iterations are too many to get there. When you have this size, you don't need too many iterations. It's a bit more evaluation per iteration, but you don't need too many iterations. So there is always an, an, a good zone there that we need to figure out for the algorithm and the problem combination. And that's the task we do every time we work with industry, to find out what is that sweet spot. OK, and then when you are going to 80 or so, it's an overkill. You don't, really don't need 80. And by taking 80, it's not reducing your iterations by too much. So it turns out to be not a good, good idea. So, so this sweet spot you need to find. The other thing we do is, was recombination important or mutation important? Because these operations. So when I do, when I plot this with one recombination size, means there is no recombination. You cannot do recombination with one, one parent. And it, we don't get a feasible solution at all. But from two parent onwards, we start to see that the algorithm is working. As you get more and more parents in your recombination, your time as well as heat updates, the number of solution evaluations go up. So based on this study, we fix it to two num number, only two parents to do recombination. After we fix the algorithm, parameterized it, now we do this scale up study. Okay? Company is interested in here, 50K, 50,000 variables, and it takes less than 10 seconds. Remember, the fellow was using whole night and getting 70 to 80%, 75%. Here, my termination condition is not to get to the optimum, because we don't know where the optimum is, but we put a target saying, as soon as we get 99.7% metal utilization, that number I just thought of, because it's about two kilo off from 650, uh, we terminate. Optimum can be from 99.7% to 100% somewhere. But for all practical purposes, that's a very big number. In fact, he was telling me 90% is, en is enough. Now, so you can see that, that this is a log scale. 
and this is also in log scale, and I get almost a linear speed up, a linear kind of uh, uh, growth, that means that this is a polynomial time algorithm, right? When you have a straight line in a log, in a log, log plot, you have polynomial time performance. But importantly, you see where you've gone, a billion variable. A billion means a giga, right? Those of you who are a little computer savvy, a giga. So to have one real number of uh, a billion variable, one integer requires four bits. So you need four gigabits of RAM to store one solution. So we had to buy a special computer where it's 256 gigabyte RAM. We had to buy, and this we did about four years ago. It was very expensive, so we got that done so we can store about 256 of the solution so that you could do this study, okay? Uh, but nowadays, of course, you can get these things uh, to do this study, but over this entire range, you can see how the algorithm performs. But there was a smart, I was presenting it somewhere, and there was a smart computer science student asked me this question. The formulation I showed you, computer science looked that problem as a knapsack problem, and knapsack problems are NP hard. You cannot have a polynomial time algorithm for solving knapsack problems. So he's, and he sees my plot, and he says it's polynomial. He says, you are violating. You're saying P equal to NP. I said, no. Each of these points is not to get to the optima. If you get to the optima, then this line will not be a straight line. It will be a super exponential line like that. But because I'm terminating early, very close to what an optimum would be, you can have a polynomial time algorithm. We all talk about it in compl computational complexity classes and all that. But here is an example where you show, and I'll show you more evidence of that with this plot. So what I've done here is we've got this termination condition changed, starting from saying 95% is okay for me. 95% utilized, 96, 97, like that. I think we did 95, then 97, and 99, 99.7 and 99.9. Look at, this is in log scale, this is regular scale. If there is a straight line here, that will mean exponentially more. I have an exponential curve here, so this means it's a super exponential growth, right? So as you want to get closer and closer to the optima, you have to spend ex super exponentially more time. So this problem is still NP-hard. I have not beaten that, nobody can beat that. But if you say I'm happy here, happy here somewhere, I can give you a polynomial time algorithm. And that's what we have done here. So it's computational complexity, theoretically speaking, is one thing. If you are now looking at it from a practical glass, it's a different thing. Now we are saying, I don't care two kilos out of 650 kilos, if I have wasted or not, right? If you can give me a fast algorithm. Because if you want to get to the optima, these times that I showed you would have been, you know, forever, a uh, long time. So evolutionary methods with these kind of recombination concepts and understanding what it takes to, uh, to get good solutions can be a way to solve such big problems. How am I doing with time? I'll mold it according to the time available. 20 minutes, okay, good, good, do it. Okay, so now I'm moving to single objective to multi-objective, and this is one of my specialities. I started back in Kanpur in 93, 94, as soon as I went there uh, with the first algorithm, and since then, you know, things have grown a whole lot in this field. And many industries are using them, but those of you who are not familiar with multi-objective optimization is that you have more than one objective, and oftentimes they're in conflict. So for example, if you want to buy a car, um, cost is something you always look at. You want to find a car with the minimum cost, but if everybody was looking for that, then everybody would have dri driven the same car, same looking car, right? But then you look at this other thing, comfort, safety, and then this is not the best car, okay? If you want to optimize this car, you will probably get something like that, okay? But that's really quite many times expensive than that. So that's the trade-off when you have multiple criteria and are of importance to you. What happens in these cases, besides just these two, there are a number of other solutions that's become optimal, and they're called Pareto optimal. Pareto was a scientist in, in, from Italy in 1896, came up with this concept. So you have a search space, which I'm showing you here in the blue shaded region here. If you don't optimize and come up with a car, you can be landing, landing up here with this combination of cost and comfort. Imagine that. If you spend all that effort to get this car in the market, nobody will buy it. Why? Because if A, somebody is producing A, it's cheaper than yours. It's also better comfortable than yours. So who is going to buy your car? So you should optimize so that your car 
is falling on this red line. So this red line is very important. It's called Pareto optimal if you are interested in more than criteria. What I told you before about brittle solution, industry people don't like just lightweight. They also look at safety and other things. This is the reason, because if you just do minimum cost, you get some solution that is not so good for other criteria. So the question is that you are not giving me one solution if I'm interested in both. You are telling me there are a number of solutions. Yes, you cannot have one solution which is best for both because there is conflict. But there are a lot of other benefits if you have, if you go and find the number of designs here. So you know what are possible. You know what kind of cost range you're talking about, what kind of comfort range you're talking about before you go and choose. So multi-objective optimization has this optimization aspect which you have to do to get these number of Pareto solutions. And then there's a decision-making aspect, okay? Now the business people uh, comes into the field uh, where somebody has to make a choice. In case of car, it is you because you are buying it. If you go to uh, any auto, auto showroom, you will see that there are five, six, ten different cars with the prices marked on them. So this, every one of them, you know the price. And this one, you read the magazine, you do a test drive to figure out how comfortable it is. So this one, you are figuring out yourself. And at the back of your mind, you are actually making that trade-off and computing one. So if you do that for cars, you do that for kitchen appliances, why not in general, right? So that's the whole concept. So back in 2001, I came up with this book where I talked about all these different things. Um, when you have a multi-objective problem, Ideally, you should solve them to get a number of Pareto solutions, and then the decision makers have to come and choose one from it, okay? Now, it could be this one for some people, it will be that one for some other people, but that's how the multi-objective problems are. But there are a lot of other benefits which I will get to very soon. So there are, NSGA was one method we developed in 94, and then that has a parameter, and we are trying to change that parameter over the years. Finally, in 2000, we came up with the algorithm. The paper got published in 2002, and that's the paper professor was talking about, uh, got very high citation. Uh, it's the NSGA2 paper came out in IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation. I think I don't know how to better here, maybe you're wrong. Okay, so uh, yeah. So that one in Google Scholar has now more than 30,000. So it's, it's really, taken the, uh, the evolutionary optimization out of computer science and engineering and to many, many fields like medicine, astronomy, and all that. Quite a few software companies have adopted this. They have an NSGA2 button uh, that they can use it for. Okay, so NSGA2 works for two and three objective problems very nicely. Then we uh, found that they don't extend if you do four, five, six objectives very well because there are some compromises we made in one aspect of the algorithm. It took us a few years to figure that out. We were thinking in a different way, but then back in 2014, we came up with NSGA3, okay? And that one, we had to provide some kind of guidance using some reference lines that we preset and then we have to map these lines to the actual objective space. So all these are perfected by now, and we have source codes available. Um, this is how both these algorithms work. Here, NSGA2 is running on a two objective problem, F1, F2. You can see that it can finally get to the Pareto front. Uh, there's nothing below it, so this is where you get stuck. And this is a three objective problem solved using NSGA3. You can see when it comes around how nice a distribution you can get. This is F1, F2, and F3, three axes, or three objectives, all the three want to minimize. And here is a nice set of trade-off solutions you can see. NSGA2 cannot give you that kind of uh, performance. So uh, in the NSGA3 paper, we have shown up to about 20 objectives. You can go now. So for all practical purposes, industries have not gone beyond 10 objectives so far. So we are fine as far as the practical problems are concerned. I'm going to show you now a couple of examples. This problem is from GM. And we've taken permission and all that now to talk about it, although we are not getting and showing you any too much in detail. But just to tell you what we, are, what we have done there. So this problem, they gave us, there are six objectives in this, okay? Uh, they said one of them, which is Y1. Initially, they didn't tell us what is that Y1 means, okay? That is the most important one, but other fives are also important. In one of the meetings, while talking, they said Y1, 184 kg, 
ah, it rang a bell to me. I said, it must be weight then. And they just, you know, realized they did a mistake <laughs> telling us. But then it was a good thing for us to know that they're talking about weight. Lightweight is one thing, but as I told you, weight is not the only thing. They have five other criteria that they're interested in. And I, till today, I still don't know what are those other five objectives, because they haven't done a slip of tongue uh, for all those five objectives. There are 145 variables, so it's not a toy problem we do it uh, in a class project or anything. 146 constraints. And every of these variable is a discrete value at a step of 0 0.05. I again don't know the units, OK? What actually the units mean, but 0 0.05. They must have normalized and all that, uh, taken the context out and given us that, OK? First, I told my students, so many constraints. Let's see how, what percentage of the, of the solutions, random solutions, are feasible. And he created 2.5 million, yeah, 2.5 million solutions at random without using any algorithm overnight for the whole weekend. Uh, none of them turned out to be feasible. So if you randomly create 2.5 million solutions, none of them turned out to be feasible. So you have to use an algorithm to get to at least one feasible. And then we are talking about optimum. These are the kind of complexity you have to handle if you're solving industry problems. OK, this is one problem where they give us the function values, when we give a vector of 145 variables, also the Jacobians, which means the gradients are available of all the objective functions and constraints. So we said, let's use them because they're coming free to us. So we came up with a local search method that uses the gradient. But remember, it's a, it's a gridded search space, right? It's not continuous search space. So from here, you have to go there to get the next point and there. So what does the gradient mean? Gradient only means, is meaningful, if continuity exists, right? But if you have a discrete search space, we don't have the meaning of gradient. But still, it tells us if this is the direction, maybe instead of that point, we should choose that, this point, because that's closer to the gradient. So we utilize some of these. We actually discretize the gradient and get some idea of some directions. We utilize this in our algorithm. So the goal in this problem was that they told you 184 kilo. They gave us a solution, which Currently, are, I think it's the engine, and the engine weighs 184 kilos. That makes sense, right? About, about that size, engine. Probably some alloy, which is very lightweight. They told us it's a six months project. If you can reduce the weight by 10 kilos, they would be very happy. Although there are other five objectives that they're interested in, right? So we first did our NSGA3 because it's a six objective problem. This is the weight axis. Here it's 174.51, here it's 167. So we've surpassed their expectation. So 170 X's must be different. Similarly, the two blues, the two greens. So there are three pairs of solution we found where it satisfies them. After doing that, they came up with another kind of, there are more details there, but let's leave it. This was very interesting to us. So they chose, finally looking at all these, they chose the minimum weight design, which is about 167 kilo, okay? And they were really surprised that it's possible to have 160. It's a feasible solution, right? But look at this. It's a brittle solution because there is nothing in the vicinity of that um, which is also feasible. So it's a one-off thing. So I told them, it's, it may be very difficult for you to implement that. And in fact, we looked at these 145 combinations. And I asked my student, change at every place, one at a time, to its next value, plus or minus. When they did that, none of them turned out to be feasible. So it's a solution. If you can implement exactly as I give you, it is feasible. It gives you minimum weight. But if you mix up a little bit and just go to the next one in any one of these 145 variable, you are not even feasible. So oftentimes, optimal solutions have that kind of properties. And this is one of the reasons industry people don't like optimum. So then you get into for robust design or robust solutions. So then they say this, OK, I choose that 167 kilo. OK, we like it because it's a lightweight, lightest weight. But now I gave you 146 constraints. I'm going to relax those constraints a little bit, which means they have to go and negotiate with other departments where the constraints are coming from. But they gave us a maximum limit of 0.5% constraint bound they can relax. So if, they, if we relax that, how much reduction in the weight can you do? So they were clearly interested in more reduction in weight by now changing the constraint definitions. Okay? So what we do is we pose this as a bi-objective problem. 
where we try to maximize the average, sorry, minimize the average constraint violation and maximize the savings in Y1 from 167. And you can see, ooh, we can see a trade-off where this is the original solution, where you are not violating it in any way, no constraint violation and no savings. But then as you go here, I can give you a 0.2% violation in some constraints can save you about 400 grams from that. 0.5% violation can save you about 800 grams. If you can give me more of these, if you say I can go 5% change, which may be difficult, but if you can, maybe this will go up and I can give you a one kilo reduction or two kilo reduction. But just looking at this to the designers, before you go in and select the design can give you an idea that what other things are possible around you. If I had unnecessarily made my constraint very restrictive, uh, that's why is it coming? Or if I relax some constraints, maybe I can get a good benefit on the way. So these are all the studies. It's, it's not an optimization problem defined once and for all and you just do with it. Once you get something, you look around and see what's possible before you uh, zero in. So this evolutionary way of doing it is allowing us to do all that, uh, giving a, a you know, plethora of information to designers. Okay, now the last thing I'm going to talk about is this knowledge discovery part, okay? So let's say you're doing a multi-objective optimization. Here you have one objective, which is the size of a motor. So if you are working in an electric motor design company, we are designing the motors. Compactness is one objective. I want to make it as compact as possible. Also, other objective is how much power it can deliver. Obviously, a small motor cannot deliver too much power. If you want to have large power, you need to make it big. So if you do this as a two objective optimization problem, you will see this parity to front, okay? And then maybe for today's application, you're going to choose one. Another application, you can choose another. If you make, the, make a table of all these different optimal solutions, put it on your table, you can then choose for every application. That's, of course, most people are doing that way. What I'm saying is now is a bit further than that. Now that you have maybe 10, 20, 100 different solutions here, if you open the boxes here, you'll actually see the variables, okay? There is a wearing that goes on. Those of you who know electrical motoring, there will be a wear that's wound around, the wear diameter, the insulation thickness, all these are important, right? You will see all these variables. Now, if you go from this to this to this to this, do you think those variables are randomly changing? No, there will be some kind of pattern. Now that I have all these solutions, if I try to decipher this, that pattern, that actually tells me how do I make my solution optimum? Why is my solution optimum or very good, right? And that produces a lot of knowledge. Oftentimes that knowledge comes as an innovation, which you didn't know before. That's why I gave it a name, innovization. Innovation through optimization, okay? And many, many problems, including some of my students sitting here, must have used it in their master's degree projects. Uh, we did this thing. So this one was done by another student of mine, Jane, Sachin. Uh, we did this gearbox design problem. We found 200 different gearboxes for three criteria. That's fine. We are going to choose one for implementation. That's a different issue. Now I analyze. There are 28 variables goes with this. And variables are gear thicknesses, the number of gear teeth, and one thing called the module that defines the gear shape, right? What happens if I lay them from low power to high power, all those Pareto designs? For example, the gear thicknesses are more or less the same. You see, they are changing much. Same thing with the number of gear teeth. They're not changing much. The only way the gears are ch gearboxes are changing is by this variable, module. You can see the module is monotonically increasing for more powered gearboxes. Then I fix a curve through this, and it comes out with this proportionate relationship. Module is proportional to the square root of parts, the square root law. This was not known before, but now we know from this study that if you want to design in an optimal manner, Today you have designed, let's say, a four kilowatt motor. All the variables are known, including module. Tomorrow, if you get a 16 kilowatt motor you have to design, you know the ratio is 16 by four or four. Square root of four is two. So you have to increase the module by two. When you increase the module by two, all your gear diameters increase by two. That's how your gearbox will get bigger. You actually learned the recipe of how your gearbox should be made bigger and bigger by doing this study. No other way you can get some such rich information. Any company doing this is going to lead that business because they know exactly how to create, how to create uh, optimal solutions. So first optimization and then data mining. 
Okay, so many of my students are now working in this because auto industries are very much interested in learning because they are in competition with others and they think that this will give them an edge of knowing much more than what variables are more important so they can do more quality control on them. It is just the beginning. We are doing lots of machine learning now to apply onto this. So based on that, we came up with a knowledge-driven optimization framework. But because of the lack of time, I'm not going to talk about this now. Um, I'm, going to, I'm skipping some of them. Let me see what I have at the end. Yeah, this is the last example I'm going to show you. Um, many practical problems uh, are computationally very expensive. Okay? So I showed you one problem from GM. Now I'm going to show one from Ford. Okay, um, so it, this problem happened this way. Let me show you. So this is the, uh, this is the, um, the, the water jacket so in the, for cooling the engine. These are all the water bodies, and this is one simulation. You have to do a CFD, a, 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 a finite element simulation, in order to get the water temperature distribution at the steady state. Some places they have, they are inter sorry, some places they are interested in, sorry, I'm going the other way. Uh, they are interested in finding the temperature near the, uh, near the uh, cylinders. Okay? Uh, so there are two objectives they had considered. There are two constraints, eight design variables, not many. The design variables are coming from the gasket. So there is a gasket that joins the head cylinder with the, with the main cylinder. And there are these holes you can see. There are four holes this side, there are four holes that side. This is how the water goes. Water circulates through these holes. Okay. These things are already designed. It's very difficult to change these whole sizes, okay? This whole thing is cast, right? But you can use a gasket where if you don't want one of the holes, you just block it. You just don't make a hole there, so water will not flow. Or if you want to reduce the water, the, uh, water passage, you can reduce that hole. So there are eight variables, each saying 0% to 100%, what kind of percentage reduction you want to make to the whole size. So those are eight variables. When you change any one of them, you have to do the whole process of simulation. And in this case, it takes two hours. There was another problem we did with the combustion inside the engine. That took two days, because combustion analysis is much more complex. But OK, one other thing they said here is because it takes two hours, we can only give you 60 different solutions. One is the baseline, 60 total solutions, because they will not give us the evaluation of finite element software. It's their proprietary. So the way we worked is through Excel file. So we first create 30 new designs, DOEs, the design of experiments we did using Latin Hypercube. We send them the Excel file. They set up the experiments in their computing system. And then they give us the objective values and constraints back through the Excel file. We use those. And then we make a meta model. Okay, because that's the only way to go. You cannot, with 60 evaluations, any person working in optimization will say, I cannot go anywhere. Forget about getting to the optima. Okay, but we have to still work with that because that's all they can do. So we make a meta model, which is an approximate model of the, of the objective function and constraints, optimize the meta model, find five solutions, five good solutions, send them back, add those at the Excel file. They evaluate and send us back. Like that we worked. Why? Because it worked like this. This experiment was done by the Ford person, the Ford engineer, using a standard software. I am not allowed to tell you what software it is, because that's how the software company gave me a copy to use. He said, you can never sell our name. So I'm not telling you that. But this is a standard software that works this way. So he, these are all his solutions, the blue ones that he has utilized. Finally came up with these three solutions. Okay. This is one of the objectives, which is the heat transfer coefficient you have to maximize so that there is a lot of mixing going on. It cools down further. This is the pressure drop, because if you make these things very small, there will be a pressure drop. You, don't, you want to minimize that. So here is your Pareto set, three points they found. Now what he does is he actually uses high fidelity evaluation. Sorry. This point moves here. That point moves there. And this point moves over here. Now, these are the actual high fidelity simulated objective values of these meta model solutions. He's not an optimization expert, right? He's just using this as a tool. He sees this, he has no idea what to do next because the whole process has fooled him. He thought there are nice solutions, nice trade off, okay? Because this is very good in terms of pressure drop, and this is very good in terms of heat transfer, but it's slightly more pressure drop here. So it's a nice trade off he got. 
But when you actually goes and evaluate using his high fidelity models, they're all over the place. That's where they contacted the company, software company, and said, this is what's happening. What do I do? And the company looks at it and says, what algorithm are you using? They said NSJ2, because it has NSJ2 button. Then they tell him, oh, Professor Dave is not far away from, from where you are. Maybe his NSJ2 algorithm is wrong. Why don't you check with him? And then I get a phone call from this person, Lee, and he tells me this whole story. I said, I have nothing to do with that software. They have used my NSJ2 code and somehow coded it. I don't know. I didn't get a single penny. So I'm not taking any responsibility what they have done. Yeah, it's my algorithm, but I don't know what they have done with it, right? But if you really want to solve it, let's talk. Because I still do research, so we could do stuff. So then we had a two-year project to do this, and I'll show you what we've done. So in the process, we came up with a very formalism of what surrogate modeling is all about in multi-objective. Uh, so this is a big, there are two PhD students I have now on this. What we did was these trust region-based methods. Because if you are, it's an eight-dimensional space. You have only 30 points you've created. Now you're trying to make a meta model. Obviously, there are too few points. So every place you have evaluated with high fidelity, we put a circle around it saying, this model that I'm going to make is only valid in that small circle area. Far away from where I've evaluated, I have no trust on it. So there are proper trust region methods based optimization in the, in the literature. We borrowed it. Actually, we had to use two trust regions here, but let's not go into the detail. And now we run it uh, 30 at a time, the first time, and then five at a time were coming. And you can see what we get. So here are all my population. And you can see here that these are eight holes, eight va variables that I have. Uh, this one, the first one, only goes from about 30 something to about 80%. So you don't have to open it that much or so much. But look at some of these things. Some of these things have narrowed down so much. This one, for example, almost everything has 100%. You have to make that wide open. So you actually learn a whole lot. If you look at what is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you actually know what is the range of each of them. And then looking at these things, you can go back and then see why this is so. Why the seventh one has to be 100% open. Why this one, the next one, sixth one, has to be completely stopped or maybe blocked completely. You need to go inside now the design and see what's the relative position of six and seven. Maybe seven, opening it is, has an inside much better way the water to flow than the six. So they understood all that. And again, they're not going to reveal that to me because they're not showing me the whole design, right? Um, so all these are possible, but look what happens. So we get this Pareto set, okay? This is the base design, which was good for the pressure drop because everything is open 100%. But now I am taking a little more pressure drop, high, but then a very good heat transfer. So they've based on this, they have chosen this solution and made the gasket now for their design. So uh, all these are possible with small function evaluations if you understand what goes on. Okay, I'm going to skip the other power optimization problem here and straightway come to the conclusions. So uh, I've shown you some examples from practice uh, where um, you could do a lot of improvements to what they are with not too many evaluations. Because in many cases, in practice, in an academic problem, we use 100,000 evaluations, 500,000 evaluations to get, uh, to get to anywhere. But you don't have that luxury in practical problems. So you need to be innovative and seeing how can I utilize whatever I know to do these things. Classical methods, which I say point-based methods, are important because you need to have know them for the foundation uh, evolutionary methods can give you near optimal solutions. They never guarantee getting to the optimum. In most practical problems, you don't need to know the, the exact optimum. But they can give you very quickly, as I showed you in some cases. I think customization is the key. Every problem I showed you today, we had to use customize. We had to understand what the problem is and utilize them in our. It's not a vanilla GA, download it from somewhere or use a software. Okay, you got to customize it if you want to use it in a routine manner. And then I talked about knowledge. Okay, so a lot of knowledge can come out if you have a number of solutions, and multi-objective is a way to get there, I think. So this is my plan, and I'm doing it now, taking a problem at a time, a problem class, and trying to come up with the best method for that problem class. And in that process, we are also generating a lot of knowledge. So it stays with the company. So I'm doing that company to company because they have to support my students. Unlike here, 
In the US, you need to support every student. Uh, Nobody is free. Or no, there is no support from the government or university. So I'm trying to do this with industry. So we are developing a lot of databases with that. Uh, some of them we are able to publish and talk about. Some of them we are not. So that's how it is.